I don't have a very long presentation, but I did want to make a, a, a distinction because we hear a lot about UAM, UAB, uh, AAM, all these different names that, that go into a, you know, when, when they talk about it, it's drone, there's so many different uh, things that um, Hans had mentioned before, but I think there's some things that are very uh, distinctive about what we do and how we go about doing it. So that being said, um, let me see here. Okay, uh, so what are they? So we'll start with UAM. It's literally stands for Urban Aerial Mobility. Uh, it typically flies at uh, an altitude of 122 meters or less uh, at up to 185 kilometers per hour. And they typically weigh less than about a thousand kilograms. <coughs> they're also, for the most part, there are very few that are not, but uh, for the most part, they're VTOL. There are one or two that are very short takeoff and landing within, you know, some claim to take off with a full load in less than 10 meters. Um, but still, for the most part, they're considered VTO, vertical takeoff and landing. And some can carry passengers, some can carry cargo, some can carry both. But uh, typically there's a, a UAM, the real distinctive portion is the weight, the airspeed, and the altitude at which they fly. And then of course there's UAV, which is uh, something that our aircraft is a UAV specifically. And that means strictly an aircraft that does not carry people. Um, so it's an unmanned, so typ the typical PUCA will fall under the UAV uh, 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 heading, so to speak. And it's really any class of unmanned aerial vehicle. That includes VTOL. There's some fixed wing uh, aircraft, but the VTOL um, is, is uh, included in that. Um, and of course the fixed wings, uh, even short takeoff uh, and landing or short, short takeoff vertical landing, all those are included in this class of UAV. Again, as I mentioned, it's strictly unmanned, so it includes no passengers, uh, and, and for the most part, cargo only, only, excuse me. And then lately, uh, within the last year or two, we've been hearing uh, NASA uh, come up with their own catchphrase that includes everything from UAM to UAV, um, as though it wasn't confusing enough, but they wanted to come up with a catchphrase that really covered everything. So that's where you see the AAM, the Advanced Aerial Mobility. And so that's NASA's uh, uh, giant bin that they could put UAM, UAV, VTOL, EVTOL, all those into a single uh, category that they could then refer to. Uh, particulars, uh, they, it breaks down into different types of propulsion, uh, but for the most part, there are two main types of propulsion that you would uh, see. And um, the first would be electric propulsion. So you would have an EVTOL or electric VTOL. Um, so that includes batteries or a hybrid, which is a, a, a motor that turns a generator that charges batteries and also acts as a battery extender. Um, or fuel cells, fuel cells providing power or turboelectric uh, power as well. And then of course there's piston turbine. So the, in the hybrid you would have the, uh, 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 excuse me, in the, in the piston turbine, they could either be cross shafted. There's several VTOLs out there that are trying, that are vying for VTOL, excuse me, VTOLs out there that are vying for UAM space. Um, and those specifically are, uh, they're cross-shafted uh, turbine, or they use turbines that cross-shaft to to rotors, uh, say for example, on a tilt wing, uh, or direct drive. Um, for our aircraft in specific, we are a turboelectric hybrid, excuse me, a turboelectric drivetrain, which means we do not use batteries whatsoever. Um, mm -hmm. We produce all the power that we consume um, and vice versa. And so that, without storing any kind of batteries, we do have a battery on board, but that's strictly for, uh, to be able to start the turbines or to power an electrical bus, uh, a, a DC powered electrical bus. But outside of that, there's no other, uh, power storage except in the fuel itself. Our aircraft uses jet fuel. It uses a, um, uh, uses safran turbines and those safran turbines turn generators which then provide electric power for each one of the four fans that you see over my the shoulder my shoulder um, in the picture in the background that I have. Uh, general aviation regulatory requirements also does break out by sector. So the UAM sector, um, so you may have two. You may have a passenger carrier aircraft that's, uh, that's uh, unpiloted. So that's kind of the goal for uh, most UAM is to have unpiloted, passenger carrier aircraft. However, 
there is no clear path right now to be able to get there. Um, and so uh, most of the UAM operators now are saying that they will be piloted. Um, and so they will carry a pilot on board like a, like a commercial helicopter would. Um, of course, if you don't carry passengers, the need for a pilot is negated or not really required. Um, but for a UAM that does not carry, that doesn't have a pilot but carries passengers, there's no current, there's no rule that currently exists. For the others that do carry a pilot, uh, because they have several different um, uh, features that are new or new to the regulatory uh, agencies, uh, for the most part, they get pushed into, I'm using the FAA here, but there are similar uh, rules within the EASA and several of the other regulatory uh, agencies. But for example, in the FAA, they're using uh, uh, CFR in this instance is, is the Code of Federal Regulations. So 14 CFR is the 14th Code of Federal Regulations, and it's part 21.17 and paragraph B. That's the starting point. That that delineates by weight. It delineates the or the aircraft by weight, by manned or unmanned, um, by uh, airspeed, by altitude, by several other things. Um, and then, of course, noise standards. Noise standards are part of and parcel of the um, uh, the the regulatory requirements. So there. Are, the goal is that they can't be more noisy than helicopters, and actually they need to be much less noisy than helicopters. Um, typically would be in, in service. Um, and then of course the UAVs, uh, there are two uh, main headings under those. It's the under 600 kilograms, so anything um, in, in Imperial it's 1,320 pounds, but anything under 600 kilograms uh, falls under part 107. So. Um, there are some aircraft that are uh, uh, are trying to gain their more than 1,300, oops, sorry, there we go, sorry, that are looking for certification under part uh, 2117B, excuse me, looking for certification under 107 that do weigh, weigh more than 1,320 pounds. There are some barriers to that. For example, part 107 does not allow uh, flights outside of uh, a specific envelope, uh, flight envelope, so we can't fly higher than 100 feet, excuse me, 400 feet, or uh, thir um, what is it, the 185, can't fly faster than 185 knots. Um, there, there's a, a number of different uh, uh, restrictions to 107. They were really made for the uh, UAVs that are a bit below the 100, uh, excuse me, that fly below the 400 feet altitude, which is 200, no, I forgot what it was, 100 and something meters, um, and fly at a lower speed. Uh, but it was really meant for the smaller UAVs, but there are, people, there are companies out there now that are trying to do much larger UAVs uh, to be able to do the, to, to be able to fly the, uh, there under those rules. They're very restrictive though. Most are trying to steer clear of that. Um, and then, of course, the other uh, requirement is that if you're flying without a pilot, uh, regardless of the uh, airspeed, uh, but uh, uh, airspeed or weight or anything else, uh, if, if you're over 600 kilograms and you're trying to fly without a pilot and you're flying even cargo, uh, you must fly with a ground operator for both EASA and FAA. And what that means is the aircraft itself can be autonomous or semi-autonomous, but there must be a an operator on the ground who is familiar with, who is uh, um, aware of the contact with the ground, uh, or where, excuse me, aware of the flight path plan, flight path of the aircraft, uh, but is in contact with air traffic control, so can change the flight path upon command of the uh, of air traffic control. Um, let's see here. Uh, cost uh, to certificate the aircraft, this is in, in American dollars, U.S. dollars, uh, but it's also broken out here by um, uh, the use of, the, or uh, broken out by how the uh, specific between UAM, UAV, and I'll give us as an example, uh, as Saberwing. But UAM typically flies batteries. There are a few that are looking at hybrids to do range extender, but they typically fly batteries, and those batteries are very high-density batteries. 
Um, so that means that they're very, uh, uh, because they're high density, they're actually very prone to uh, catastrophic failure, even if they suffer slight damage. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of the batteries that are being proposed are currently not allowed to be flown in, in uh, cargo compartments of aircraft because of the fact that they're very high density. Um, as we were told by the FAA once, they're, they're considered to be little bobs. Um, the, excuse me for a minute, I've got someone who's trying to reach me. Uh, but anyway, they're considered to be small bombs and so the FAA has to come up with requirements that will make um, uh, the, um, th that'll allow them to fly that high density uh, aircraft uh, using those batteries. Um, so the air, air, the FAA really um, uh, is very busy and focused on trying to get that, uh, you know, how they go about doing this, um, how they go about, excuse me, doing the, um, the, the certification of what the requirements are for certification. Um, the other thing is that there's unknown standards uh, for other things. For example, how do you carry passengers on an unmanned or an unpiloted aircraft? How do you carry passengers, um, especially if the aircraft is flying like a part 107 aircraft? So low altitude, uh, lower speed, but in very congested airspace. It's in an airspace, especially in inside cities where uh, UAM is being proposed. Um, it's, there's so many, many layers of complexity. So you have to have a detect and avoid system that can fly the aircraft regardless of visibility. So it should in theory be able to fly in zero visibility and still be able to fly amongst buildings and find a landing pad and also miss other uh, UAM in the sky. Um, and so that's a very difficult thing. And there are not many uh, people out there. One of the other barriers as well is the fact that the, uh, uh, UTM still needs to be determined, the uh, um, uh, unmanned or the unmanned traffic management. Uh, one of the questions we get asked constantly is what kind of UTM do you use? And I always have to tell people we actually don't use, we use the oldest UTM there is, which is called the air traffic control system, because we have an operator on the ground that's monitoring the aircraft and in touch with air traffic control. We follow all the current uh, regulations for flying aircraft in general. For us specifically in the United States, it's a federal aviation requirement, or excuse me, 14 CFR uh, part 91, which governs the operation of the aircraft. So we have all the instruments, instrumentation, everything else to be able to fly that aircraft under instrument conditions. And the reason it's instrument conditions is because uh, in theory, you cannot see outside of our aircraft. We do have cameras, we do have other things on board, but in theory, you cannot see outside of the aircraft. So every flight by definition is a flight in, uh, instrument meteorological conditions where you cannot see outside of the aircraft, which then gives us the authorization to take off, fly a flight plan, and land at a destination airport uh, without the, it, it, even in the case of communication failure. So if our aircraft does not, uh, it, it loses its satellite link and is not in contact with the FAA, with the aircraft, with the ground operator, excuse me, we still know where the aircraft is as our backup. Uh, we're able to get on the telephone and call air traffic control to inform them where we are. We also have the other things on board that the regular commercial aircraft have. We are a regular commercial aircraft. We're certificated in the same way. So we have ADSB, which is the automatic direct broadcast uh, satellite uh, or uh, automatic direct surveillance broadcast, uh, which keeps track of aircraft. That's the standard throughout the world. Uh, we also have a transponder. We have several other items on board that allow the operator and air traffic control to see where the aircraft is at all times. So regardless of a lost communication, um, we're still able to, to speak, uh, to know and learn where the aircraft is at any time. Um, and then, uh, for example, UAM, if they're a hybrid or an EVTOL hybrid that use both batteries and a motor on board to, to charge the aircraft, it's that same extender motor that must also be certified so or certificated. It must have a type certificate. So it must, in most cases, carry an FAA Part 33 certification or for that matter, a C CSE the, for EASA, CSE type uh, Part 33 certification to be used on board the aircraft. Some of the rules in the FAA allow the aircraft to certificate non-standard or non-certified parts 
Uh, however, the the requirements for that certification are are almost as though you have to go through a complete certification effort in itself. But uh, but there are provisions for under Part Twenty One Seventeen B under which the aircraft can become certificated. Certificate. Um, and then, of course, in the UAVs, for us specifically, we're a TE VTOL. You've, I'm sh sure people have heard EVTOL, which is electric VTOL. That includes batteries. However, we're a turboelectric drivetrain, hence the TE VTOL, so turboelectric VTOL, which in this case, again, means no batteries. We strictly we consume all the power that the aircraft produces. Um, so under 600 kilograms uh, cost, of course, uh, because we're not carrying people, we're also not. Uh, uh, we're also flying under known standards, which is FAR Part 23, FAR Part uh, 91, and those. A lot of the requirements for the safety of the carriage of human beings can be omitted, um, or and so we can run a, an abbreviated Part 23 certification program, uh, which means our our cost is considerably less, less than about 50 million or less uh, U.S. dollars for the type certificate. Um, and then, of course, there's the uh, uh, above 600 and uh, kilograms, and that's also typically. And th this is for those that incorporate Part 107. So those those companies who are uh, are uh, that weigh 600 kilograms or less, excuse me, um, and wish to fly under Part 107 or similar to Part 107 rules. While there's no existing uh, uh, program, no existing uh, federal aviation regulation that covers that, uh, they will have to meet certain requirements to show that they're safe to operate at low altitudes and higher speeds. So similar to that UAM airspace as well. There, right now, because there are no existing uh, regulations, they're estimating that it could run as high as $100 uh, million for that certification effort. Pat, you have three minutes left. Okay, thank you. Uh, barriers to certification, very quickly, as I mentioned before, flying high-density batteries, as, as I mentioned, the FAA call them little bombs, uh, or it's like flying little bombs on board. Uh, also, the need for approved uh, and homogenized standards for UTM. Uh, flight in 107 airspace, that's 122 meters or less, at up to 185 kilometers per hour. And, of course, the approval of propulsion, and uh, which is the electric motors or generators in the case of a hybrid or even TV. TEVTOL, and then flight with or without a pilot. These are barriers that have to be still have to be determined. For UAV, for example, for us, um, the approval uh, is only to fly over heavily uh, den heavy density populated areas, and then of course we're using uh, uh, Part 2117B ourselves to tailor uh, Part 23 to include parts of Part 33 for motors. 35 for propellers and rotors, and 27 for helicopters. And that's it. Um, the, here's an image of the aircraft uh, as it appeared in a, in a previous publication, but this is what it looks like um, in, in operation. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know if we have any questions.